Listen. The Old Guard is the next big franchise Netflix has in their hands. Based on the comic book that they want to turn into a trilogy. It has Charlize Theron so you know she's gonna kick ass. But honestly, it was the philosophy dealing with immortality that intrigued me way more than the action. Reminding you that dying is easy, but living is harder. Let me explain. So the old guard consists of Andy, Booker, Joe, and Nikki, who are hundreds if not thousands of years old. They're named after the oldest US infantry, but they don't really work for anyone in particular. Their main goal is just to do good and try to be holy. So you good guys or bad guys? Depends on the century. Charlize plays Andy, a 6,000 year old warrior who sees immortality more as just being lonely, you know? It just means that she's been around long enough to see the most people die. The closest thing to that that I could relate to as a mere mortal was, you know, dogs. They live for such a short period. I've gone through three big experiences now where I've lost dogs in my life and it's brutal. Mm. It's so brutal. Nikki and Joe met when they were fighting in the Crusades opposite of each other and after killing each other several times they fell in love meanwhile booker is the baby of the group and he just sees what they have as a curse they don't necessarily need to hold on to memories because they're gonna live forever so they can forget about something it's never really gonna disappear um it's when it's when you know that you're gonna die you hold on to memories because you know they'll never come back but if you live forever you, you know you might run into a similar type of event in the future. Since they've lived so long, they've mastered the art of tasting, they can drink more than Mel Gibson, they've been fighting for so long, they just went through a bunch of fighting styles for their training uh, leading up to the movie, because really they're just being burned and killed more times than Kenny. And so to get into that state of mind, director Gina prince Bythewood also made sure her actors read Dave Grossman's book On Killing, The Psychological Costs of Learning to Kill in War in Society, a book also used for a Black Mirror episode and used to learn the psychological cost of learning to kill in war in society. Because if there's been one through line they've seen in humanity throughout all of the thousands of years that they've been living, it's violence. So full spoilers for the comic, the movie, and Dave Grossman's book on killing the psychological cost of learning. So the movie really gets going when the four have dreams of a new person getting what they consider either a gift or a curse of becoming immortal and that happens every time a new one comes in and while they don't really ever explain their powers or how they get them or the purpose of them getting them they haven't had a new immortal since booker back in 1812 now freeman was a marine who got killed in afghanistan and when she's revived her own squad turns on her because they're scared a theme we see throughout where people shun something they don't understand unless they could use it for profit. So she's kidnapped and joins a new family. What's funny is that Kiki's first day on set was the plane scene where she goes one-on-one -on -one with Charlize and you know she gets Kevin weared down. I still can't believe that they trusted my non-experienced ass <laughs> to be on a moving thing I throwing you, punches. Sister, I'm, I'm with you. I'm always like, are you guys for real? When I was in the comic was mainly the character, you know, that the reader vicariously lives through since she's new, everything's practically being explained to her. In the movie, she's there to challenge Andy's 6,000 years of experience. God doesn't exist. My God does. Was that him? Her father also served and went missing, and now that's something she has to do because the old guard sees relationships as distractions, especially Booker, who recalls the story of his son, who he couldn't save from cancer, and now he lives with the guilt that he couldn't save his loved one while he's saving the rest of humanity. For Andy, that hits even harder since she has like 4,000 plus more years of loss heartbreak and seeing the cycles of violence humans find themselves in. She doesn't need to learn history. She is history. And throughout all of that, she starts to lose her purpose. You haven't asked. Your business is yours. You need help. Or does it matter why? Copley is a CIA agent who's worked with them in order to stop criminal syndicates in the past until he dupes them into taking on a mission that's just a setup to get him on camera. He lost his wife to ALS, so he's addicted to finding out how to obtain their gift, something that Booker falls into as well, but in reverse, and so they look to Merrick the Muggle for answers. He's one of the biggest pharmaceutical CEOs who's trying to get rid of the evil stigma that the industry has by hunting down immortals and harvesting their bodies so that he can live longer and make more money. They end up finding their hideout and kidnap Nikki and Joey, but not Booker. Sure. And it's in that transport that we get a scene Marvel hasn't had the balls to do. In fact, Greg Rucka, the writer who also adapted the screenplay for the movie, had it in the contract that the speech could not be cut. If I love this man beyond measure and reason, he's not my boyfriend. He's old and he's more. Incurable romantic. Oh, <laughs> 
In the comic, Merrick also comes off way more Bilzerian than he does Zuckerberg, with that stabbing scene being uh, way more Tarantino than the movie was going for. She might not survive the testing. This will be murder. As if the CIA never disappeared anyone. Niles rescues the team with the final fight having a twist, and that's that Andy isn't immortal anymore. And I know better than to expect an origin to why they get this ability, or at least one that's going to please most, but I do half like the immortality that they're playing with. How it's not fully bulletproof, how they can die, meaning they still have some stakes, that, that they still have a little of humanity in them. But at the same time, I know what happens in the second novel, I, I just don't want it to come off too convenient. In the end, Merrick goes from being at the top to literally the bottom when he can't extract what he wants. They shun Booker, who was already depressed as it is, and turn Copley into their oracle, who will be there to scrub them from history and keep them safe. But that doesn't scrub the consequences of their past past actions. It's nice to finally meet you. Like I said, it's meant to be a trilogy, and the second book is already out, and I think it's pretty good. Since Greg Rucka wrote the comics, and now he's doing the screenplay, it's been interesting to see how each has influenced each other. But the second is cool because it, it deals with Queen, who we see in a flashback was the first immortal Andy found, and after fighting together for years upon years for humanity, it's humanity that locks her up in an Iron Maiden and, and throws her into the ocean. Now, some may argue that Andy could have done more to find her at the bottom of the never-ending ocean, but clearly Quinn rusted herself out there and has kidnapped Booker just to see if Andy would go look for him. And considering how dark it is that she was dying over and over and over and over by drowning, I mean, the fact she pulled up and took a sip... Yeah, she, mean, she means business. I'm really curious to see them adapt the conversations between Andy and Quinn as they argue about hope, how one sees the world as devoid of it because nothing ever changes, and in fact believes their powers were not given for them to be angels, but devils. Exterminators, in fact, to the vermin that is humanity. And Andy's like, please say psych. I am curious to see them cover the effects of big companies and how the previous evils of the world have just been repackaged into corporations and so they're able to get away with it because it's organized. For me, one of the standout scenes from the first is when Nikki and Joe call out the lackey running tests on them who's convinced themselves that what they're doing is okay because it's in the name of science. You think I go too far? That I am unethical? I would say immoral. I believe this can change the world. I find justification. I've heard it so many times before. There's a lot that's already been said about power and the abuse of it. I'm sure Andy laughed when she saw the Stanford Prison Experiment, which I do recommend. But what I think the sequel can tackle well is community. How being alone makes you vulnerable as isolation starts to diminish your purpose. But it's those around you who can also predetermine it. And if all hope is lost, it can get dark. Today, I put this on your wound. Tomorrow, you help someone up when they fall. Copley, who sees math as the one common language humanity has shared throughout, proposes the patterns he's obsessively noticed in history that one good deed Andy or the group did in one period ended up rippling into positive change generations later, and that that's their purpose. Be it immortal or not, it's realizing that the decisions we make in our present time will last beyond our lifetime. Thank you guys for checking out this video. I'm curious to know your thoughts down below in the comments section. First things first, I, I really do like the songs that were used in the movie. Like, I like them. But I would rather the budget go to more of the set pieces uh, than the soundtrack, especially with all of the flashbacks that they're going to be doing. If you read the comic, you know that Andy has a lot of past lovers that I would love to see sequences for. And I personally think they got to make it a show, you know. Give Charlize that Marvel money. I don't, they don't call me. I don't no, know. I, no, I swear to God, I've never, I've never gotten anything... No, I'm not lying to you, um, but that's okay. You know what? I am paving my own way. I'm I'm creating my own opportunities, so it's all right. Hell yeah. The only big franchises I want to see her in is like Mission Impossible, just so she can go whoop Tom Cruise's ass. But considering some of the talks in the sequel, which get really deep, uh, Queen does propose some hefty stuff. So, you know, we may see her going to the other side and, and get a more furious Charlize. And, you know, remember when she was the bad guy against Dom? Everyone knows what the F in that series stands for. Familia. And she made them turn on them. You're gonna turn your back on family? I'm curious to see where this goes, uh, and I really do hope that they keep Gina on board because I think she did a great job with the adaptation, um, especially just the, the the psyche of the characters, and I think that she could do way more of that. I know she was signed on to do Silver and Black, but if she can just continue doing this, you know, kind of like how they wanted the Star Wars directors to control a whole trilogy and stuff, that would be dope. Um, but I'm curious to know your thoughts, differences that you've noticed in the two comic books, according to the adaptation as well. 
Any of your thoughts down below in the comment section. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. Fortunately, uh, I have to wrap up. Are you in a video store? Are you a blogger?